Hey guys, this is LC Holt, more live than I deserve to be. And this is my update for October 22nd. Now, before we get started in the show today, I want to remind you guys that the Indiegogo campaign for this here film, Butcher's Bluff, which I'll be appearing in next year, is still underway. So if you want to contribute to the Indiegogo campaign and see me go up against this guy, you need to go down to the description in the YouTube video, or you can go to the comment section in Facebook, or you can go to the thread in Twitter, and you'll find out all that good stuff. Also, in all those spots, you'll find out more information about a movie that this guy that I'm going to be talking to here today wrote and directed. There he is right there, Jay Burleson. So, this movie, The Nobodies, it is available now through Troma. Jay, how you doing today, man? I'm doing good. Here it is, The Nobodies. Beautiful. Now, from Troma. Yeah, and I was just on, we should point out that uh, my uh, good friend Lane Hughes, who is the guy from your next to wear that beautiful mask there behind me, is the star of The Nobodies. And he was on this show previously, and we were talking about it. Um, before we get into your involvement with Lane and everything, this is a question that I like to ask people who are filmmaking friends of mine. And it's interesting because um, everybody's answer is different. But Jay, why filmmaking? Of all things you could do, even creatively, what was the thing that got you into filmmaking? It's just always been a part of what I wanted to do as far back as I can remember, man. Um, my mom showed me basically all the you know, classic horror movies when I was like five, six, seven years old. And during that time period, I can remember watching those movies, Halloween being one of them, and then wanting to make my own sequel to it, just like acting it out with my friends and my cousins and stuff like that. And it just never went away. So at different stages of my life, you know, it developed more into like a, a hobby where I actually had a camera and it wasn't just my imagination. And, and then in high school, uh, you know, it got a little bit more serious as I got older. And then right out of high school, I was just like, this is all I want to do. I got to make movies. So I've been trying to do that ever since. So when you first started out, what was the format you shot on? Did you shoot on DV? Uh, I know the first camera I had was one of those old VHS where you just looked it was, at it. it. It was VHS. And then right after that, it was like the tail end of VHS. And then I had VHSC, which was like the compact VHS. That's actually what most of the nobodies was shot on the nobodies is a movie within a movie. So this really bad exploitation film called pumpkin is set in the nineties. And we shot it on VHSC because I had all those old VHSC tapes and I just like recycled all of those. So I taped over all over all of the old movies that I made when I was a kid, most of them. Oh, that's cool. So did you do, when you shot back then, did you do the editing in camera or did you hook it up to a VCR? And it was it VCRs on? and it was terrible, man. Two VCRs. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Like all my early stuff is like uh, pretty much I started making movies the year Blair Witch Project came out. So as a kid, I'm like 12 and I think, well, all you got to do is just grab your friends and a camera and say you're making a documentary and go in the woods. You know, <laughs> my first movies were just uh, Blair Witch Project ripoffs. <laughs> now did you send them to film festivals or anything no no i think in high school i think we submitted one thing we did to like this film festival in auburn but for the most part i was just i i sold movies online i had a website and stuff like that and we'd sell them uh for like five dollars on vhs and stuff and it's cool we man we got in so much trouble one of the first movies i made after the blair witch stuff was this movie that my friend that i met on the internet uh, on a Halloween movie message board. Uh, his name's Cody Hammond. I'm still good friends with him. Um, he wrote a script for a slasher movie set on New Year's uh, Eve. And I made the movie here in Alabama. He's in Ohio. And we were like 13. And we had t-shirts made that had the title slash on it. And uh, I was selling copies at school and got called into the principal's office. My cousin and I, he was in the movie, my cousin Aaron. And the principal was like, we got uh, we got some information that you made a movie about kids killing kids. <laughs> you're selling it for you know you got t-shirts and you can't you can't do that. You can't bring that stuff here anymore. You know because this was like right after a couple years after Columbine. You know and they were like oh. I'm sure I was on like some watch list. In oh, after that 
But then the next year, the newspaper did a, a article on me making movies and the principal, the same one, shook my hand and was like, that's really great. You're making those movies. And I was like, wait a minute, what? Like, <laughs> like, ready to kick me out of school for it, basically. Yeah, that's the amazing thing that I've learned, too, is that once if you're just a kid trying to do stuff, you're kind of a degenerate. But once you get a little bit of success or someone notices you, people are like, oh, you're brilliant. You're genius. Right. It can be the same thing that you did. Like this movie is the perfect example. It's a really bad movie inside of a fake documentary about the really bad movie. And I'm sure when my friends, you know, saw me shooting on VHS, they were like, this movie's never going to go anywhere. People that see me on the internet and now it's out through an actual company and people seem to look at me differently, even though it's like, if you saw the movie, your original perception would be correct. Like it's insanity, you know, like it's just silliness. And not just any company though, but old uncle Lloyd's company. Yeah. Good old how did, Lloyd. How did uh, that come about that they, uh, that they picked it up? They have open submissions and I just sent the movie to them. Well, I think first I, I emailed them and I said, hey, you know, here's the synopsis, the trailer and the poster. And then they said, yeah, we want to see a screener. And two weeks later, they said, if you still have it, we want it. And it was that easy, man, which was funny because I had this movie took years to make. I, you were actually shooting your next when I emailed Lane and was like, Hey, I got an idea for this really crazy movie. We're going to shoot on VHS and stuff. And he was in Missouri. I remember being like, well, I'll just go ahead and send it to him. And when he gets back, we'll talk about it. And we've had a cut of it done by like 2014. It was really one of those things like, you know, we'd shoot every few months when we had money. It says on the description on the box that, you know, what $600 to make this movie within the movie, which is actually an accurate figure. I had like my friend, Andrew Wasserberger, uh, hooked me up with 600 bucks and I bought two VHSC cameras and, um, you know, had a little bit of money to start the, the actual filming process. And then we just, you know, it took years to shoot it and rework parts of it. But what I was getting at, man, is I had the movie done and I was trying festivals and it just wasn't going anywhere. So that was another like two years of just like trying to figure out what do we do with it? And I, I was stuck in this mindset of like, well, it has to get into festival somewhere. That's how it's going to get distribution. And finally, I gave up on that. It played one festival at the time. I sent it out for distribution, and two weeks later, I had a deal. So it's one of those things where I feel like I wasted two years, but at the same time, I feel like it was the right time. The woman that was working at Trauma that I feel is responsible for picking it up, her name's Elizabeth D'Ambrosio. Um, I think that's how you say her name. She left trauma shortly after, and I think she had only been in that job for a few months before. I'm not really sure, but I think she's the reason we got the deal. So really it was the timing of it couldn't have been more perfect. It's just one of those things that took forever for it to actually happen. And it's interesting that you say the film festival thing, because I've had a lot of discussions with filmmaking friends of mine, acting friends of mine about that very thing. And I've had my own experiences with it, uh, with, with, you know, with Spiritus, uh, which mm -hmm. is the film that I uh, wrote and directed uh, a couple years back. Um, and uh, it's interesting because as one good friend of mine, who's an actor says, it is sort of like an artistic circle jerk. You know, you have, everyone who is friends get their friends movies into the festival and there's really not a lot of ways to get into festivals if you're a feature if you can get into a shorts program you know it's it's easier but features is almost impossible True. unless you unless you you know somebody there and I, I tell people you know it's very very hard to get your feature in there because it's not necessarily about the quality of the of the picture but it's about you know who you know Right. And so, festivals are just extremely difficult because of all the things you said. And then each festival kind of has their own plan for the year and the type of films that are going to play off other films that they've already decided they're screening. And it can be something as, you know, trivial as well. It's a good film, but it doesn't really fit the overall theme of the films we're screening this year. You know, it's like, I don't know, man, it, it really is sort of like you do have to, I think, to get into these bigger festivals with a feature you have to kind of have like festival names in it, you know, like indie darling names and stuff like that, at least to like have your film looked at more seriously. I don't really believe in the, uh, the idea of independent film festivals, like 
breaking new talent and like spotlighting people the way it was when, you know, Sundance used to do that with like in the early nineties and stuff. I don't know that you can just blindly submit in a day and age where there's so many movies being made and so many of them are bad. It's just, it makes it that much harder for your movie to, to kind of avoid the noise. There's just so much noise with all the stuff that, that's being submitted. Cause every year the records are being broken for these bigger festivals, you know, in terms of the number of submissions, I just don't know how they can fairly even look at the movies, you know, over that two year period, how many do you think you submitted to? Probably 15 to 20. And we got into one in Seattle and one that was like an online festival. And it was, I really should have submitted it to more, but I would submit like three or four when I had the money and, you know, like three or four at a time, then maybe one. So it wasn't like we went through like 75 festivals or something like that. But um, yeah, I just didn't have the money to, to submit to that many. I mean, you think about, I know filmmakers who like they've gone through 50, 70 festivals and gotten into 10, 12 with shorts and stuff. So um, I just didn't have the money to, to tackle it in that way. Yeah. Yeah, it's because it, that is a, you have to have a budget of a, almost like a festival budget in and of itself too, because that is costly after a while. Yeah, and with a movie like this, man, it's just all out of my own pocket, pretty much. After the initial six hundred bucks, it was you know there was never like a time where you look at your budget. You know what I mean? It's like, well, how much money do I have in the bank? You know, okay, yeah, we can maybe shoot next weekend, or maybe we can't. Now, do you think any of it, did you ever get any feedback in terms of content? Because I think the the nobodies, I haven't seen it, but Lane told me it has some extreme uh, content in it. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a trauma movie and it, and it's not a trauma movie, but the things that you would think of when you think of trauma, we got quite a few of those things going on in there. <laughs> well, um, well, let's talk a little bit about Mr. Hughes. Um, let's talk about how you came to know Lane Hughes and, right. and that we can share our how I met Lane Hughes stories. All right. Well, I will I will start. I grew up in the same town as Lane and we never met. Um, I think we spoke on the phone one time because I knew he had done pop school and I was trying to get started making movies around the same time. I think I contacted him. We talked on the phone about a movie I was, I was working on. This was back in 2008, maybe early 2009, but we met in 2009, but of all places we met at a drive-in theater parking lot in Atlanta, Georgia, waiting to be shipped off to a location via bus for Rob Zombie's Halloween two, which we were going to be extras in. So it was me, my friend Bart Hyatt, who's in the now bodies and Lane and his friend Elizabeth and we kind of look at each other in this line and you can tell we both are kind of like I know that person and then we start talking and it's like yeah we're from the same fucking town we make movies and here we are sitting in a line in Atlanta and that's how we met and we hung out all of us hung out the entire day of shooting on Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 and uh, he's been in my life since that day. Now that was the party scene, wasn't it? The costume yeah, party? Yeah, the Phantom Jam. I will, I'm not in it. You can't see me anywhere. Lane's in there for like a couple seconds. Wasn't he like a cow dressed as a he, cow or something? Yeah, Lane's always a cow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you my Lane Hughes uh, meeting story. And actually, when Lane was on the show, we had this conversation. And he doesn't remember the first time we met at all. But... <laughs> And I kind of fucked up the story too when I told it. I, I, so I'm going to correct it for the record here. Okay. On on the show with you, Jay. Um, when I first met Lane, it was at the Sidewalk Film Festival during a premiere. This is what I got wrong on Lane's show. I said it was during a screening or after a screening of Homesick, which is the first film I did with with Adam Wingard. That's right. actually not true. I messed that up. What happened was it was a screening of a short film that Wingard and I did called, I think, The Girlfriend that screened at Sidewalk. And after that, after the screening. Chris Illick, shot that, right? He sure did. Yeah. 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 And after that screening out on the sidewalk, uh, Adam 
Wengard uh, introduced me to Lane and said, this is a guy who's writing a zine and he's going to be interviewing me about homesick. And that's where I got my wires crossed because I knew it had something to do with homesick. Right. It wasn't at the screening. It wasn't after a screening of homesick. So that's where I first met Lane. But Lane doesn't remember that at all. Lane remembers us meeting in the basement of the house when we were shooting uh, Pop Skull, which it, to me was our second meeting. To Lane, it's our first. Uh, right. But and we've been working together uh, ever since uh, on you know on Wingard's projects, doing a lot of shorts and obviously the features, um, you know, your next and Pop Skull, and uh, we both appeared in VHS movies, just not the same one. Um, right. I do want to give a shout out to Sidewalk, which is the only festival, like legitimate festival, because the other festival that screened it in Seattle that nobody's. I don't even think they're a festival anymore. They're like one year. It's like a VHS swap meet or something that screened a couple movies and we were one of them. But Sidewalk screened the nobodies. So I was I was really uh, shocked and surprised that that happened. But they've been really good to me and, and my friends. And that's one festival that I'll always support is Sidewalk. And I've met a lot of people there that, you know, that's really how I met Chris Hillicky, who's like one of my best friends now. Is we, we knew each other, but we, we would always end up at Sidewalk, like kind of, doing our own thing and just walking around and just would hang out together and not go see films, but just like sit in restaurants and bars and stuff. So it's, it's, it's times from sidewalk. It's fun. Cause I've actually run across many of the people that we used to work with in our group back in the old days of making films in Birmingham and the surrounding area. Uh, like I just did, shot a movie last year with Joe uh, Walker who did, um, who was one of Wingard's guys, and okay. uh, I've known Chris uh, Hillicky for a, a while. Uh, we haven't worked together in, since Wingard, and so every so often I'll run across one of the old crew. We're all kind of doing our own things now, except for me and Lane, who you know we do conventions <laughs> together and everything else. In fact, we were just at a convention in, in Austin. Um, yeah, yeah. Together. So whenever you right. see, he's told me some stories about some of the stuff that happened there. It sounded like uh, it was a cool time. Oh yeah, I, did you yeah. meet Edwin Neal? Did you meet Edwin from the Texas? I did. Yeah. Okay. I really like him, man. I've emailed with him a few times throughout the years, and I guarantee he would not remember me if you were like, "Yeah, Jay Burleson." Like, who the hell is that? But I think Edwin Neal's one of the funniest people, man. From all the interviews I've seen with him, he just seems like he's always in character. Now, did you ever? Did you want to work with him at one point? Didn't you want to do a movie with him? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple times, like one of my earliest. Uh, experiments with like reaching out to actors was actually Edwin Neal and I was still in high school and I think he was just like who the hell is this kid you know like what the what is he but he emailed back and forth with me I don't know that I told him I was in high school though so maybe that's why he 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 was so uh willing to go along with the crazy shit that I was telling him but uh yeah and then I I'm Lane and I made a fake Halloween trailer for like a lost movie from the 80s like the lost Halloween 3 with Michael Myers and we gave uh, Edwin Neal a credit as the sheriff in the in that trailer. David is not in the movie and doesn't know that that trailer exists. <laughs> is it on IMDb or anything? Yes, yeah, it's, it's on IMDb. So he's I in just that. wonder if at some point he's ever been asked, like, what's with that Halloween Harvest the Souls thing? And he's just like, what the hell are you talking about? That's hilarious. So Edwin Neal could go to IMDb and see a movie he wasn't in? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he's in the credits. <laughs> I, oh, look, I, when I was in high school, I submitted Roman Polanski as a director to the new Halloween movie when it was like in development. They didn't put that on there, but they did take some of my cast suggestions. I had um, who played Lando in Star Wars? I uh, Billy D. Williams, right? Yeah. I had yeah. him as the sheriff in the new Halloween movie. They put that through. It was like on IMDb. So that is awesome. I used to submit all sorts of stuff that made me laugh. Let me confess. I'll confess okay. something because I did that one time, and I'll I'll tell you what it was. Okay. The last uh, our IMDb confessions, man. We yeah. bought them. Yeah. Uh, what it was was the last Hitchcock movie that he ever made was a movie called Family Plot. Okay. Which I like, and it's not his greatest work, but it has William Devane in it and, uh, and Karen Black, and uh, it's a really interesting movie. I think it's funny as fuck. Like it's a really funny movie. Oh, and Bruce Dern is in it too. Bruce Dern is oh, hilarious in that. Bruce Dern's awesome. 
But I, I was watching, and for some reason, like this is mid '90s. You know, I'm still a teenager at the time, and yeah. I, I think you know what. Based on the story of that, I think a good title for Family Plot, which I didn't really like the title of the movie, might have been Missing Air. Because yeah. it's one of the, I felt like, you know how uh, Hitchcock was loved his puns, right? Right. And the movie is about, you know, kind of people getting chloroformed and suffocated and stuff. And I thought, well, this is kind of a pun because it's about people looking for a missing air and it's called Missing Air. It's like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. What I did is I submitted that the original working title was Missing Air, H-E-I-R, Air. And uh, I love it. I love it. And go to IMDb right now, and you will find that the original title of that movie, according to them, was Missing Air, when in fact that is a complete L.C. Holt fabrication. That, that's great, man. I'm going to see if I can find it right now. I've been waiting over 20 years to confess that, Jay. <laughs> well, uh, if I knew how to navigate IMDb, I know what you're talking about, where it has like digital titles somewhere on here, but I can't find it right now. But I'll take your word that it's still there. That's awesome, though, because mine lasted probably a few weeks. And then they're like, wait a minute. This is the same person that said Roman Polanski was direct directing this Halloween movie. Maybe this information's bullshit. But how awesome would that be if Roman Polanski directed a Halloween movie? Yeah, it'd be pretty great. I would so watch that. You know what? I'd be pretty disappointed because I would just worry that since he can't come to America, that they would uh, they would butcher the locations and it wouldn't sound like America or Illinois at all. And it would be like some type of weird train wreck. But um, I never did this. But speaking of the IMDb stuff, when I was in my early 20s, I had this idea that I was going to create a fake person and just get them listed on the credit of some movie. And I think it was like one of the Friday the 13th movies. And I thought if I could just get them listed as like some obscure, like uncredited actor in Friday the 13th part six or some shit like that, that I could slowly start adding credits to them through their page where it's like, they've been in all these horror movies, <laughs> like a person that people would finally start to see and be like, who is this person? He says this says he's in this movie and that movie I, that part doesn't even exist. Like I had this elaborate scheme and you know I think I submitted like one thing and it I don't. It's kind of a lackluster story because I think the idea was funny but I didn't execute it so it never happened. You know I think I, when you mentioned that I swear there was a guy who was a complete fabrication that was on IMDb like in the nineties because I did one of the first. Uh, things I did that I don't think I got any credit for, but I was a little bit part in this Michael Mann movie called uh, The Insider. And oh, that's cool. When they first put the um, the credits up, um, I, there was a guy that was listed on there as like, you know, guy number two on street or something. And then I clicked him and it was like every single movie practically that was made in the last three years, this guy had some little bit role, like guy walking across street, guy this, guy that. Yeah. And, it the was busiest something, extra in, in Hollywood. Right. And it's either like the busiest extra in Hollywood was determined to have the longest IMDb credit, you know, filmography in history, or somebody did what you were talking about doing and made up that guy and just put him in roles that you could not prove he didn't do. Right. In every movie <laughs> that you could imagine. Yeah, I just find stuff like that to be really fun and exciting. I've had a lot of fun with IMDb. Not... In recent years, once I've started making movies, I'm a little bit more serious about it, you know, like making sure credits are correct for my stuff and things like that. But when I was in my teens and early 20s, I just thought that it was like anybody could submit something to it. Then why not just like have fun with it? Because you, you know, it's because you're the victim of bullshit on IMDb when you're young and you're, you get excited about something you read on there. And it's like completely not true. And it made me just sort of be like, well, if you guys are going to screw with me, I'm going to screw with you guys. Yeah. Well, you know, and not, not only that, but you have Wikipedia. And Hughes was telling me, I think, about something that happened to him on Wikipedia where his page listed him as a 22-year-old Mexican-American. <laughs> yeah, no. It seems that I don't think it's so much Wikipedia. I think it's Google. Like if you Google Lane... It's fixed now, but it was, you know, it has like pictures to the side of the Google res search results and it had a different person and it still says through Wikipedia, but it's on Google that he's from Mexico and a Mexican American actor musician. But what's funny is I see Hannah's pop up sometimes. 
when it comes up on the nobodies. And it's not Hannah. It's a picture of somebody else. It like listed as like the top cast and it's like Hannah Hughes. And it's like, that's not Hannah Hughes. That's just another woman. That's so weird. It's, it is weird. Oh, I should also point out now that you mentioned that, that Hannah Hughes, someone who I worked with several times in, we were both in VHS too. Unfortunately, we didn't have any scenes together, but we were both in Pop Skull. And again, we didn't have any scenes together. But Hannah Hughes is actually a friend. We did a short film with Wingard, and she's in The Nobodies. She is. Yep. Yep. Um, which was a like big get for me because I was making movies, you know, just in my backyard. And Lane was like, well, I could get Hannah for me, you know, or whatever. And uh, so I worked with her one day. And I think it was probably like, I think we probably really freaked her out because it was like insanity. Like we meet in Birmingham at a strip club. It's all sorts of chaos. Then we have to drive an hour back here to shoot in a trailer park and like this crazy looking trailer. And it's within this movie that's purposely supposed to be bad. And the acting is just like way over the top, you know? So like, just think that you meet these people for the first time you're with them like five hours total, maybe six, seven. I have probably a longer day than that, honestly. But you know, I just felt like we probably like really, could not have had a worse first impression on Hannah Hughes as who we, we were as people by her being in Pumpkin, which is the movie within the movie. But it ended up that she, when she saw The Nobody, she was very complimentary of it and seemed to really be into it. And I was like, okay, hopefully she understands now what we were doing that day. Because it was just like, you would have to see The Nobodies and see her scene at the trailer park to understand like what she must have been thinking, having just met all of us and like, we're making a movie, Hannah, and we got like a VHS camera and like this guy that's acting with her is just like the craziest person that you'll ever meet. And he's just like screaming at her and stuff. And it's like, it's it's all fun. Good, good times. Yeah, Hannah is, is great. I like, she's a really good actress. Uh, yeah, I think she's great, man. Um, but uh, so before we hop into our next section here, where we're going to discuss a little bit about you know, a little movie that just came out called Halloween. Uh, was there anything you wanted to ask me? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you what you're working on now, like what your current projects are. I know you've got Spiritus, and that's, I don't know exactly where that's at. It's done, right? Yeah, Spiritus is done. That's, uh, I have a copy of it over here. That's this movie here. Sweet. Hold on, man. We got we to gotta both be holding up copies of our movies at the same time. That's the nobody, then there's Spiritus. There you go. Love it. Sweet. We should mail <laughs> each other a copy of yeah. our movies. Yeah, send me send me uh send me your address and I'll I'll get that out to you like right away. I would love to see Sweet. I got a box full of the nobodies right here for cast and crew, and I, I'm sure I got an extra one I can mail you out of there. Awesome. I'll send you my uh my uh my uh, address and i would cool, love to cool. see it because me and hughes have talked about it a lot there's a lot of downtime at these conventions and we get to talk about stuff you know that we yeah. work on but what, what's happening with the spiritus and and i'm glad you mentioned that spiritus is the the pre-order campaign ended a while back and all the orders are actually getting sent out to the people who pre-ordered it and so at the end of the month, it'll be available in DVD for uh, other folks, and then it'll go on to like uh, streaming platforms. Sweet. Awesome. Uh, so that's where that stands. In terms of acting, I've actually got a lot of projects coming up for next year, which I'm really excited about. The one that I mentioned before, which is Butcher's Bluff. Uh, I got a, I'm doing a remake of Savage Vengeance. Uh, that uh, Donald Farmer is, is producing a remake to his own movie, uh, being directed by a, a real talented guy named uh, Jake Zelch. And yeah, a couple yeah. other things. There's one I can't really talk about yet. And then there's one I'm helping to develop the script on, uh, which, so there are four right now. That's awesome, uh, man. So I, I'm planning on doing a lot of acting, but I have some ideas turning over about, you know, things I might direct and you learn a lot. I mean, as you know, when you make a movie and you go through the whole process, including post and the whole distribution thing, you learn so much that, you know, I've learned a lot on sets as an actor about how a film gets made, but until you go from point A to point Z, you know, on a film, you <laughs> yeah. don't know, you know, and now and then that back I again. Exactly. So you learn things and then you think, well, this is how not to do certain things. And this is how to right. improve other aspects. And so I'm kind of excited about maybe uh, 
directing stuff. I've written a number of scripts since Spiritus. Yeah, um, my feeling on it, man, is I'm a, I always have multiple things going at once. It takes me forever to get something completely done. So, like, the Nobodies, I had another movie that featured that I was working on at the same time. I have two features that I'm finishing right now that I've been working on since 2014 and 15, roughly, you know. So I'm always just trying to do as much as I can. And I feel like the only way you get better at directing in particular is just to keep doing it. You know, you gotta, even if some of the stuff you're doing maybe isn't like amazing or the greatest thing ever, or you're not totally satisfied with it, at least you're getting out there and working with actors and problem solving on set and stuff. That's the only way you're going to get better at it. And if you're not spending a lot of money to do it, then I think that's, that's the way to do it, man. You can't just sit around with your forever thinking like, well, somebody's going to read it and I'm going to make, make all these connections and get all these meetings and get, you know, millions of dollars to go make it. It's like, I'd much rather be turning stuff out right now to figure out how to even make movies so that when I get that opportunity, I'm hopefully ready, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Cause that's the, I, I've always been the kind of guy that's like, you learn through doing stuff, you know, trial and error and just, and then I think we're very similar in that regard. And in, in, in so much as we always are working on something like I feel uh, completely useless if I'm not working on two or three things at one time, you know? Oh yeah, man. We're definitely the same then. Cause one thing I noticed is I'll get burnt out on something and then I have that other project that's kind of been sitting there for the last month because I've been busy on the other one and I can just jump back into that one, you know, and I, I can always be doing something even if I'm not like really in there doing like the, the bulk of the work, you know, you're always problem solving something. You're, you're, you're figuring something out uh, even if you're not shooting or editing in that moment. And something I'd, I'd, I'll send you to um, is I've been working for almost a year now on a short story anthology collection, uh, prose uh, writing. And uh, mm. that's something I worked on a lot when, I, when I'm not working on, you know, film stuff. So that's fun because I actually wrote three full length novels. Oh, I, wow. I that's, didn't, that's crazy. I, I didn't like, you know, but... I, they're not ready to be put out and I don't think they will yeah. ever go out, but you do have to do that in order to find, you know, like, cause prose writing is very different from screenwriting. So you have to find a voice, yeah. you have to find a rhythm, you have to find how it works for you. And so that's how I learned how to write prose is not, it's just by writing three novels. You know? Right. See, I, I can write a screenplay and maybe this is the wrong opinion to have, but I almost feel like, if someone said to me, I'm not a writer, I wouldn't know where to start, I would still tell them with confidence, you could write a screenplay. But when it comes to like writing a novel, oh man, I, I don't have the confidence as a writer to do that. But screenplay, man, I feel like I can I can do that. There's just something about it to me that's it's not the same thing at all, like you were just saying. A screenplay, even me as someone who doesn't really consider themselves to be a writer, I feel pretty confident in my ability to, to write some dialogue and describe the action and move it along and understand the story elements of it, you know? Yeah. So more power to you to be able to write three novels, even if you're like, oh, they're not any good. Like, you got to start somewhere. And the fact that you can get them written is a, is a great indicator of where you can go in the future with your writing. Yeah, and it is a lot of, you know, and I do find that one kind of informs the other, too. I think my screenwriting has gotten better since I was writing books yeah even though it's completely different mediums and you know obviously when you're writing a screenplay it's what's happening right now this is what's happening at this very moment and when you work yeah. in prose you go back and forth you know and you can go into people's lives and stuff but you know without getting too much into that i, I kind of wanted to jump into a little discussion about let's do the it. new halloween movie now this let's movie came out uh yesterday i saw it yesterday i guess it technically came out on thursday night but for those of you who haven't seen the movie, and since today is only like the second official day that it's been out, I just want to tell you, there'll probably be spoilers. So yeah. if you haven't seen the movie yet that me and Jay are about to be talking about, Halloween uh, 2018, you might want to stop watching now, okay? Because we're, we're probably going to spoil some things. But with that out of the way, um, what did you think, Jay, overall of Halloween? I guess I should start by saying... Uh, you know, some people are really into like super movies and 
you know, Star Wars or whatever. They're like fanboys of that. Excuse me. Um, that's Halloween for me. I grew up with Halloween. It's probably the most influential film for me in terms of like me as a creator at anything. Um, so I view Halloween differently. I view it like a lot of people view Star Wars, you know, that saw it when they were kids and grew up with Star Wars. Um, so I, I liked a lot of things about it, but at the same time, when the credits rolled, I was a little, I don't want to say disappointed, maybe underwhelmed. It, it just, I didn't have that feeling that I wanted to have at the end of it. And I don't know how to work through it because I do want to say it's definitely, I like it a lot better than the Rob Zombie Halloween movies, which I wasn't crazy about. Um, and it's a better, th better than probably most all the sequels past the first two movies. Uh, but so keep that in mind. Like it's a really good Halloween movie, but I still wanted more and felt like that there were definitely some missteps along the way. Yeah. I, I, I think we have a very similar uh, opinion about it. I kind of view it as, as this, I, I view it as a good sequel. Um, I look at, actually, the person I went to see it with, when we walked out of the movie theater, I, they said, what did you think? And my initial reaction was, I thought it was one of the better sequels. In my opinion, it's kind of like Halloween 1, 2, and then maybe this one. Right. Uh, that was, because it's a really well-made movie, and you could tell absolutely that there were things in there that they didn't just, I mean, there are things in there that didn't, don't usually happen in a Halloween sequel. And mm -hmm. I, I like that they went to certain areas. I think they could have gone even farther uh, with that a little bit. But, um, and there are a lot of uh, uh, nods to things that weren't just the first, even though this really is paying homage to the first film. I mean, did you, you notice uh, the Mr. Yeah, Elrod thing? Mr. Like Elrod thing. And, um, you know, even from, and this is in the, a lot of the preview material that they've released. Um, when he, he goes into the woman's house that she has her hair up and she's kind of got like, uh, the woman from Halloween too, you know, that's making the sandwich that, that shows like a nod to that moment. Um, there's, there's a, a lot of others too, but yeah, you're right. It's not just the first film. There's nods to a lot of the other ones in there as well. And there's probably nods to more, <coughs> excuse me, than we noticed. Yeah. Then I noticed probably on second viewing, I'll see more. Uh, I, I was talking on, on. Facebook uh, yesterday and someone pointed out to me and we were talking about this before the show that there is uh, a PJ souls cameo that I didn't yeah. notice when I watched. I didn't movie. pick up on it either, man. But she is the voice of the teacher in the scene. That's it's very reminiscent of a scene in the first movie with the character. Very Allison. Much. Yeah. Um, which was, I, really I loved Allison. I thought she was great, man. I felt like we needed more of her. That was one of the things that I felt like, it introduced a lot of characters and they did a good job of endearing almost all of them to you, but it was just sort of like, maybe it's sort of like, I'm not a big superhero movie fan, but I hear a lot of people talk about like they throw too many characters in there and they don't have enough time to really develop them. I felt like this movie suffered a little bit from that where it was just like, we're with these people. Now we're with these people. Now we're back with these people and they all don't really get to stay around quite long enough or you're not sure who to really, invest your time your your emotions in and uh that was one of the issues i had with it yeah and i think that some of the teenage stuff probably could have been axed um yeah um but i, I know I you know. need it's to have the teenagers in there for i, I suppose for it to be a, a halloween movie there has to be some teenagers that get killed right but, but one thing i did like about the teenagers is that the teenagers look like teenagers yes absolutely you and know cast as a whole that was really my mom, I went to see it with her because she showed me Halloween when I was a kid, as I mentioned earlier. So I thought it would be cool that we go see it together because she really raised me on all this stuff. And like very early in the movie, she made a similar comment about how everyone just looks like pretty much like real people. You know, I did appreciate that. I think I think David Gordon Green did a great job with a lot of stuff. So anything that I say negative about the movie, um, don't take it too seriously. It is as far as Halloween movies go, a cut above pretty much all of them, especially in terms of just like, I think he's one of the best directors to have worked in the franchise other than Carpenter. Absolutely. Yeah, he does bring a lot to it that, 
you can you can he sits him as a director in it, which is not something you can say about a lot of the other. Well, obviously Rob Zombie, his movies are very Rob Zombie. Like there's mm-hmm. no there's no doubt that Rob Zombie directed those two Halloween movies. Yeah, yeah. Which maybe I think is part of the fan criticism about it is it was perhaps a little too Rob Zombie. Right. Too much, Absolutely. Know. Yeah. But you know, which love Brandon, or hate those movies, he did his thing. I. I not to go on like a Rob Zombie rant about it, but one thing I really appreciate about him, man, is his remakes came out at the time that the Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street remakes came out, and they suffered from CW casting, the prettiest people we can find. The movies look really sharp and like manufactured, you know. His were completely the way they should be, you know, old school horror films. He did his own thing, he cast. The movies the correct way in my opinion he did a lot of things right even though i'm not a big fan of those movies yeah i agree it's his style is you know you have that dark gritty extremely gritty yeah. what i call uh, the rob zombie dirty underwear style you know <laughs> off direction <laughs> that's hilarious well you just know that everybody's got dirty underwear in this movie um, yeah yeah <laughs> if they're wearing underwear at all right yeah and i liked i, I I'll probably be raked over the coals for this, but I I like the first Rob Zombie Halloween. Okay, I, I'll I'll say I in some ways really like the second one because it's so fucking insane. And maybe because I was on set for a day and I met Lane there, and you know I had this experience with my friends on it that maybe I look at it a little favorably because of that. But it's not really a Halloween movie to me. But I like a lot of the stuff that he was doing about how, you know, Laurie Strode's dealing with this and approaching it from more of a realistic way. And, um, yeah, that movie's, it gets a bad reputation. I think the sequel, both of them do. And I don't even like really like the movies that much, but I don't know, man, Halloween movies are hard for me. Cause even if I don't like them, I still like them no matter what. Like Halloween five as a kid was like my favorite Halloween movie. And I still love it because of the nostalgia, you know? So there's not I love that the, I don't I like. love I love that mask in Halloween five. I, I'm a big fan of the Halloween five mask. I, I know, and a lot of people really hate it, but I'll tell you what, I'll take that mask any day over the Halloween four mask. I think the Halloween four mask looks like me and you smoked a bunch of pot and like went and made a mask and we're like, look at it, man, you know, like it should cost three dollars that mask. Yeah, yeah, because it is essentially just like a sheet of plastic with eye holes cut in. It's very flat <laughs> and very uninspired, and uh, yeah, it's it's so bad. And a lot of people seem to like that mask, and I'm like, how? How can you like that mask? I didn't like the mask, and well, I didn't. I'm not a huge H2O fan, but I didn't like that mask. I thought it had that mask is all messed up, man. It's the same sort of flat look, you know, as it's not as bad as four, but it's about it's not. It's almost it almost it's just like if this is four in terms of bad mask, Halloween H2O is like right there, a notch below. Yeah. Yeah. Um the H2O mask um has a lot of problems that like there's it's it's CGI in one scene, the mask. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and the the bathroom scene where she looks through the stall crack, there's this, this CGI mask. Uh, and now the Halloween four mask, this shows you how wrong they were getting it from the beginning. You probably heard some of this stuff too. It's on some of the like making up stuff, but the hair was the wrong color on the mask. Like they had the mask, and they're like, "We're ready to shoot the movie," and someone's like. That that's not right. The hair on the mask is the wrong color, and everyone was just sort of like, "Is it? <laughs> you guys never seen the fucking movie before? You know, like how could you get hired to make the Michael Myers mask and make the hair the wrong color? And no one says anything until you're like about to go film the movie. And then there is the infamous scene where you have the flesh-colored mask with the blonde hair that's in the movie. Yeah, it's in the movie. Yeah. Now, I've been on a lot of film sets, and I know there are a lot of people standing around. And people, I remember seeing a documentary where they were like, oh, I don't think we noticed before we shot. I've never been on a movie where someone didn't notice that the main character focused in the shot is wearing the wrong mask. That would be yeah. like me showing up for your next, and I'm wearing a pig mask, and no one noticed. You know? Right. Adam's just like, all right, let's go. Now, I will say, me and Lane, Lane's character in the Nobody's, has one arm through a lot of the film. Actually, really all of it other than one flashback, as it is the end result, at least. 
um, we shot some scenes one night in a hotel room. We're like 30 minutes into shooting. I look over at him and I'm like, fuck, man, you had both your arms out this entire time. And he's like, you're right, I did. <laughs> I guess me and Lane could make the mistake of having the wrong Michael Myers mask and not realizing it. Actually, no, we take Michael Myers too seriously uh, to, to fuck that up. But Yeah, uh, yeah well, that's, a, that's a hard one. Things happen. Yeah, yeah. I think I still think Halloween for that scene. Somebody was fucking with us. Yes, yeah, so I. I can't remember the story I heard on it. It was like they they had already shot that. That was like the first day, and that they couldn't go back and reshoot that as they finished the scene or something with the right mask. I I don't know. Yeah, uh, well, I'll give you kind of my uh, my favorite masks from the series. Let's do it. I um, like how we were like there may be spoilers about the new Halloween. <laughs> Like, let's rate the mask of the other Halloween movies. We haven't about the new one. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're I actually, like, I'm enjoying this a lot, though. So Yeah, we're like 15 minutes left in the interview, and we're talking about the Halloween movie masks. But I'll just throw I want you to rank this new one, though. Put this in your ranking. Okay. All right, I will. Uh, and after this, as I... As far as masks go. Okay. Uh, this is where I go. I, you know, we're gonna put the first one aside. The first one is iconic. It's my number yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. So that aside, I'm gonna say that I really like the number two mask from Halloween Two. I really like the number five mask from Halloween Five. <coughs> Excuse me. And I would say probably the next is the one from the new one. Okay, I agree. The first mask is the best. Um, the Halloween two mask actually does bother me a little bit because it's, it, it's still great, but there's something about the fact that it's, I don't know. It's the same mask from the first one. It's just aged a few years, but it's supposed to be the same night. So that's how critical I think of it. It's like, it doesn't quite look the same. I mean, it's just disappointing to me that none of the films have gotten it right. The mask from the original. Mm -hmm. None I've been able to get it as good as that one, including this new one, because they went with the aged route too, which I do really like it. But uh, the the closest it got to being the original again was Rob Zombie's remake when it's a new mask and little Michael Myers wears it, which completely ruins it because we only see it in that scene where he's wearing it and it doesn't fit him and he's like a little kid, you know? And yeah. then it, it's like that mask though, in that scene where the boyfriend's wearing it, you know, with Judith and stuff like that, that mask looks fucking great. It's like, yes, they got the mask right, but then they ruin it by being like, well, let's put it under the floorboards of the house for, you know, 20 years or whatever, or 15. But um, I would say I mostly agree. I would put the Halloween 6 mask in there around the same place as 5 and maybe just under the new one. I think it's, it's actually a pretty good mask as far as these things go. It's a hell of a lot better than 4 and H2O for sure. Yeah, H two O was resurrection is pretty. It's resurrection. The whole movie is just like not good. Yeah, yeah, I would say the the worst is uh, a four. Four, I would say is worse, and then but I think I've already said that 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 was my ranking on that. But now getting back to the new Halloween for the last few minutes that we have here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I will say that when the film opened, there's a pre credit sequence. And I was really digging the pre-credit sequence for for probably about half of it, and then something Dude. happened in that pre-credit sequence that I Tell went, oh, I went, oh dear, no, no, no. And then they cut to that to the Halloween title, and I was like, okay, you got me back. Right. But the people freaking out in the pre-credit was too sequence, much. It was it too was much. Too much. I was sitting there when the guy started going, Vigo, 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 Vigo. I was like, oh, fuck me. No, tell me this isn't happening. It was just Now like we're talking. Now I feel like I can really tell you how I feel. Because when they're talking and it's the new doctor, you know, and he's telling them all this stuff about Michael or whatever, it I felt like I was watching, and I mean this in a good way, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with Michael Myers in it. You know, and I knew it was just going to be that moment, but I was like, this is good. It's so well directed. It feels good. And then it went, a, it lost me just a little bit with that. It went just a little bit too far. It was like, it didn't quite earn that moment, I think. It probably was better on the page. I'm like, yeah, and then they're all going crazy, you know? Um, yeah, I, I agree 100% with what you just said. And I was not a huge fan of the investigative reporter, particularly the, the guy. Um, 
uh, not the actor. I'm not saying anything about the actor because who knows? I might work with him someday. But I right. mean the, the character. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of. But I, I thought I was. I was happy when when he got smashed. Here's my my take on those two characters. They're great because you can have all the exposition you want, and it makes sense for the movie because they're you know making a podcast, true crime thing. Um, I felt like they overstayed their welcome by about 15 minutes. Like I wish that they could have just set up the beginning that we got, you know, and then introduce Lori again, maybe. I mean, that's fine. But then I feel like them still being a part of the story. And this is where I'm going to dive deep into like being a super Halloween nerd. But it, I get it's 40 years later. He's been locked up. He's a little more unhinged. You're going to develop him. He's not going to be, um, you know, in the original, he doesn't really kill very many people. Obviously, that's going to change, but there was something in that gas station scene that I loved when when he gets the gas back, and it's in the trailer, like he goes in the stall. So this isn't a big spoiler. They get killed, you know. Like, right. but I love how you can see him in the background, out of focus, pulling up to the gas station, and all that stuff is like, man, they get it. The part I didn't love is that he then goes inside in broad daylight the morning after escaping from the institution and just kills basically everybody in the gas station. And, you know, it's like, I would have liked that scene a lot better. If you see him creep up, creep up, they go in and they come back and the trunks open and some of their papers have fallen out or flew out, you know, and the mask is just gone. And then you see him putting it on somewhere, you know, it's like, I felt like it was just a, a bridge too far for me to think that in, in general, the scope of how much he kills was just a little bit too much. But that scene in particular was just like, I could have done without it. But I agree with those characters. was crazy about how long they stayed in the film. So I have a solution for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I have better way to do it, but that did bother me. Now, I did want to open the, this package I have here because I just got it. My friend brought it up. Um, just got delivered. I bought this. Oh, so, man. That's badass. This is the, and apparently this is the collector's edition of it, the actual vinyl looks pretty crazy so i will see if i can open this so if you got based on what i said what do you think though um I felt like you know they they made him more like he is in some of the sequels in terms of his ability to kill people which seemed like it contradicted what they said about making him more like a real person i mean he stomped somebody's head like he's tyler main rob zombie michael myers in this movie you know yeah. which i fine with it but it's just like it i don't know some of that stuff just doesn't make any sense to me yeah he, he definitely had that inhuman strength um though he, he did react a couple times to pain but which is unusual for him but oh let me see that oh yeah hell yeah now what is that a um let's see say something jay so it'll pop back to you and hey so this is in my record collection now. I guess this is target practice. So that's pretty cool. And let's see, where's the actual record at? Okay, this is even different than what I thought it was going to look like. Wow. That's badass, man crazy i don't even really listen to records but i was like sure and sure i'll open it and i'll put it on because the music i mean we we would be crazy not to mention how good the music is i mean it is really good yeah I'm probably my favorite part. Part. came back yeah the, <clears throat> my favorite part of the movie probably is the, i love the end credits that um that remix sort of thing I, we were talking about before with yeah yeah that's part. really good yeah, the Cody Carpenter guitar in there is is, is awesome, uh, and some of the other pieces are really great. And it has that you know John Carpenter thing where it is, it doesn't bring attention to itself. It sort of underscored, lays the carpet, and, and just when you need a good little sting, there's a sting, but it's not beating you over the head with you know, with with too much, which I I, I really like. I, I like John Carpenter's approach to composing just in general in that sense. Yeah, that it's just like it's the carpet as he's always said, you know, it's, it's just, it's down there. It's not like you, everything you just said is how he, he describes it. it. It doesn't bring too much attention to itself. 
Yeah, that was, uh, but I would say, you know, I think next week we're going to do a more in-depth discussion of Halloween. Unfortunately, this time we couldn't get into it too much because we had a lot of other stuff to talk about. But yeah, I think we could probably sit here and talk about Halloween in general for uh, days. <laughs> no, I mean, it took us like five minutes of talking about Halloween to, to deep dive into like talking about the mask. And yeah, man, I that's one thing I can talk about for a, a very long time. Yeah, yeah. It's and right now, I mean, it's something to discuss because everybody's talking about Halloween. It looks like it's going to make eighty million dollars. Dude, I saw those numbers. Incredible. I that thrills me. I'm really glad that they're doing that. But what I hope that you'll talk about next time is kind of like where do you think it goes now? Because I feel like they made a mistake in a way. Because I mean, it's hard to say you're about to make eighty million dollars opening weekend, set all these records, and that you made a mistake, but. I worry that because they brought Laurie Strode back and to this film and now they've introduced her family members, I hope they don't pigeonhole themselves into now Michael has to go fight these people again. Because it to me, that's the same problem that they had in the original franchise of giving him too much of, you know, the same opposition every time. He's got to kill his family. I hope that they step away from, well, now he's trying to kill Allison Strode and you know, like, man, it, it just feels like they would set themselves up, set, set themselves up to um, really destroy any potential for this franchise to have longevity if, if they go that route. That's my yeah. opinion, and, and that's that's an interesting kind of catch 22, because you do have, you know, the you want to see Laurie fight Michael, you know, everybody wants to see that. But now that it's a completely random attack, she's no longer his sister. You could go anywhere with it. Yeah, and you know, I think could, that's what they need to do. I think that's what they need to do, too. Now, th we've been pretty spoiler-free for our Halloween section of this discussion, but I will say this much, and that is that it does set up for a rematch, I think, pretty heavily. Uh, that was yeah, I mean, thing I didn't really love was the ending because I didn't feel a sense of resolution about anything at the end. I just felt no. like, okay. <laughs> now, I... I had heard that they reshot the ending and I'll tell you, my friend sent me the script and I didn't read all of it, but I skimmed over some of it before I saw it. Spoilers don't really mean shit to me, but I did read the original ending because it had been pretty much confirmed that they had reshot it. And it is different. The script ending is different than the ending that we got. And I got to say, I like the ending in the script better. And I feel like that was probably test screening results came in. They didn't like the ending. And then we got this ending because the ending in the script, I thought was cool. I thought it was cool. I'll tell you what it is if you want to know what it is. I would love to know what it is. Okay. It's basically, and I just went to the last page and read that. I didn't read the last few pages or whatever, but what I took from it, just kind of reading it very quickly was it's almost like the ending to Shane, you know, where he's like, he's riding off on his horse, but he's injured and, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, he rode off to the sunset. Other people like, no, he's dead. It's basically the ending of shame with Michael Myers in the woods somewhere near that house where all the ending takes place. And he's breathing the same way he always does, but it's extremely labored. And the way it's written basically is saying he's breathing, but is it his last breath? And the movie ends and he's got his, his fingers are missing, which is something that happens in, in the film still, uh, which I thought was really cool. It, it's sort of like, you decide, is he unstoppable and he goes on forever? Or did they finally feed him and he's about to die sitting here on this log in the woods? Yeah, that's really interesting. I like that. It's a lot different, you know, just it, it to me, it makes more sense from like the, the movie that David Gordon Green made. I can see why that in the script, that was the ending. It, it kind of feels right. Where and I just felt sort of like the last frame. It's like, it's cool. I get what they're saying, but eh. Yeah, the ending as it is now does feel to me unresolved. And that that sounds like a, a more interesting, I kind of like that ending. The yeah, and it also sets it up to where, yeah, the movie makes 80 million. Well, obviously he's still alive. He was still breathing and he was just sitting right there, you know? So it's easy because right now it's sort of like they can't start the movie without Oh, well, he didn't actually die. You know, you thought, and it's like, we're right back where we started with all the remakes and sequels where it's like, oh, yeah. I mean, we've already seen the ending to this movie before. 
you know, yeah. it's into all over again. Is he in a coma now? You know, like, is you know, like, I just feel like they've set themselves up to, to have to make some of the same mistakes or figure out a better way to not make those mistakes. It's not the best position to be in. Yeah. And if it does become a sequel a year type thing, which it probably will for a few years, I'm afraid. Um, and, there, and there's no way they're not rushing this thing into production with the numbers they have right now. I had heard before it even came out, the rumor was that they had a writer attached and that David Gordon Green will not direct. Yeah, man. So, well, I, maybe they'll continue some sort of a trend where they get somebody who is willing to put their own spin on it each time. That might be interesting. If you get yeah. someone equivalent to David Gordon Green or you get – you know, uh, somebody who has a, a point of view where they can do interesting things and they're not uh, sort of, they don't have their hands creatively tied into a formula, which I think the original series had that a little bit, the kind of thing where we right. can't do this and we can't do that. The um, one thing I'll say against what you're saying, because I agree with it in principle, but the first thing that comes to mind is like, they kind of did do that in the original series with Halloween 5. That's when shit starts to get batshit crazy because that guy obviously was able to do pretty much whatever he wanted. And he's like, well, Jamie's a mute now and they have this uh, psychic connection, you know, and it's like, wait, what? So sometimes that can be a hindrance to your story because then you end up with Halloween, the curse of Michael Myers, where they're like, well, we got to explain all that crazy shit. And this right. is what we came up with, you know. So it's like, I don't know, man. I I don't have a good answer for where they need to go or how they need to handle it, but um, I'll be there opening night no matter what. So I guess it really doesn't matter. They got my money. Yeah. And I think on that note, that's probably where we should uh, end our discussion for today, even though this has been a hell of a fun discussion, Jay, I've enjoyed it a lot. I, I've enjoyed it too, man. Yeah. We're going to have to do this. We're definitely going to have to do this again. Um, definitely. I'm game. But for all of you guys watching, I want you to go check out Jay's new movie, which is The Nobodies, now available from Troma. You can find more information on how you can uh, watch it in the uh, comment section on Facebook and the thread on Twitter and down in the YouTube description of this video. Um, I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank Jay. I thank you again for being here. This was a great time. My pleasure. This was probably uh, this was a really fun hour, I must admit. Um, and it flew I'll by, man. It flew yeah. by. I mean, man, when you have a good discussion going, I, these these shows go really quickly. Um, but guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and tune in next week where we'll be talking more about Halloween 2018. So until then, uh, goodbye, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you later.